This is a pod. A pod about dogs. Hi everybody and welcome to the Healthy Dog Pod. Today in the studio we've got myself and uh, Sophie as always. Hi. And we are joined by one of the Bondi Behaviourist team members, Jocelyn Suter. Hi. Hello. Hello. Well, welcome. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Joss has been with me f- nearly four years and she is... Um, one of our most experienced dog trainers, probably the most experienced by myself. Um, <laughs> not really. <laughs> um, and she specializes particularly with like building recall, um, puppy training, and really what I would say is like cementing in the relationship and communication patterns between the owner and their dog. Um, and, you know, she's much better at that shit than I am. That's why she does it, <laughs> and I don't. <laughs> um, what, um, what we're going to talk about today, Joss, is just a little bit about, uh, you know, how you got into the industry, um, what you've done. I mean, you've worked in this indus- the dog industry and pet care industry in more than just a trainer. Yes. So a bit about your background and what you're passionate about. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay. I've been in the industry about 10, 11 years. So I began as having a mobile grooming business and learning how to handle dogs that way in a very um, pressured situation where dogs were not enjoying grooming whatsoever. So I learned how to handle and actually calm dogs. So in that job particularly, I learned how to train in my own way, how to handle dogs in stressful situations and what would actually make them feel better despite what was going on in um my grooming trailer which is never fun for dogs no Uh, not at all yeah and the thing is is that from puppies also it was rehabilitation so learning puppies at the beginning how to actually handle noises so i was very patient clients were really aware that um i had the patience and the time to spend with them rather than just get in there and clip them and create behavioral issues based on grooming so a large part of that started in that business and it then brought me to wanting to extend my education with training so got into dog training with you yeah and basically worked alongside of you for a while um spent many hours many hours in the car <laughs> traveling around talking about behavior <laughs> um about how it all worked asking you many many questions and you getting extremely annoyed (laughs) 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 but also learning so much more about um even though i had the basics um understanding theory theory of mind of dogs and what actually was going on um dog psychology well dog psychology yeah and then took a course and um became a trainer Also, being a dog owner myself and training horses as a young kid, I learned very quickly that um, I had no fear of animals, but was very curious (laughs) um, about what was going on at the time and found them fascinating, Um, as well as then applying that to working with dogs and people different game isn't it yeah absolutely <laughs> we've said this many many times as soon times. as you said that it, yeah yeah so like you can learn about the animals all you want but then you got to explain that to somebody who you actually don't like the thing is when you're having a conversation with somebody about dogs like you don't know their no. level of understanding and comprehension absolutely no. not so you're just like oh shit i gotta i don't want to i don't want to teach you how to suck eggs but i also need re- i really need you to understand everything going on as much as possible well that's it too and that's where i also being a teacher in japan and what i didn't know that you were teaching in japan yes i was teaching in japan i was in japan for five and a half years and i was a teacher i went over from canada when i was young younger (laughs) girl can you speak japanese a little Um, bit (laughs) <laughs> yes, yeah, I can say that hi means to, yes. I can say hi, to. <laughs> hi, I do my mesh there. Jocelyn oh, does. Very good. Yes. Um, it's very bad. I used to call it taxi Japanese, but anyway, um, <laughs> I got away with it. Um, got you by. Yeah, that's right. So um, before I went to Japan and during Japan, I actually went over as a teacher. So um, my background and parents were both teachers. So it's in the blood. So the combination of also wanting to educate has a large part to deal with people educating uh, educating children education education, <laughs> education <laughs> son. Hey. what the japanese was okay so as a teacher in the past in japan um i 
obviously taught many, many grades, design curriculum, also understanding English as a second language, you had to slow yourself down. Mm -hmm. You had to enunciate and actually make sure that the kids understood in a different language what you were asking of them. Same thing applies when you walk into any consult, any puppy school that we do and I do, in that the dogs are one thing, but uh, teaching and educating people to understand what it is is going on with their dog is paramount. And sometimes the most difficult part of it. I find dogs really easy, on average. <laughs> well, I think that's something. <laughs> yeah, I've know, said that before. Haven't in, yeah. In uh, in in regards to like you know people that get into dog training, typically they're very good at training dogs, communicating with dogs. They've got that yeah. a relationship that's where they right. feel very comfortable, at least, whether they're yes. good at it or not. But they're very comfortable <laughs> communicating uh, that way with the dog. But it's. Then you go, you know, into a consult, like you say, and you've got to be able to communicate with mm. the dog at the same time as communicating with the person. But then what Joss is really good at um, and got a lot more patience for than me is teaching classes, mm. uh, puppy classes, where she's got multiple dogs on the go at the same time. She's got multiple clients at the same time. She's got different ages, you know. Children. Breeds, yeah. Children. Different breeds. Heaps of questions. Yeah. And also, too, depending on where the puppy school is held, you also have smells and noises and an area like a vet where the dogs come into a space and we have to actually make them feel comfortable as well as the people feel comfortable with strangers and other dogs and breeds and sizes and ages. Um, it all combines into, could be absolute chaos, but I'd hope to think that I don't create that, that I actually help them <laughs> settle <laughs> and help bring it down a level so that everyone can, one, learn, but you also have to be so quick on your feet. And I think I've learned that, one, because of age and experience, but also having the teacher and the dog handling background and horses that um, all of that combines to putting yourself in someone else's place, trying to understand where they're coming from so that when a client walks in with a puppy, even first owner, first time owners of pups, that's a whole other level, but not really. I think all pet owners, no matter how many dogs they've had in the past or animals they've had in the past, um, with behavior as well as training, it's changed so much. Um, even from when I was a child and how I trained my puppies when I was young, I had that thing that I was able to do it. But that has changed so much, as in the theory of dominance back then was very much relevant. Um, it was about physical force and not actually listening to your dog or actually teaching um, and just making it comply. Being, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, being, yeah, exactly. And also not watching body language. But I actually did know that my parents, some, yeah, some people no. really intrinsically um just aware of that and they it's not about them making the dog comply they even though that's what the information they've been given that's right. it's like that's that's the way i always saw it, it was like mm. I, I knew only knew you know in terms of what i'd read and heard and was dominance theory but for me it was never about tr just making the dog comply like you don't uh it was always more than that. You know, the dog was communicating back and some, some people, it's just in, from day one, they, they're having that conversation with the animal yes. and yeah, it's like, yeah, like you said. And say. also just, um, you know, recently with, uh, classes or just walking into consults and, uh, particularly going into families nowadays. Um, and we're talking about, you know, it's November and Christmas is coming. And a lot of families, I'm sure, listening to this and people are thinking about buying puppies. It's really important that you set your pup up for success from the very get-go, from the first day that they arrive. And also, too, it's bringing your puppy into not only external environment or internal environment, it's also the whole family. So teaching a lot of children to understand puppy language, puppy body language, what is expected, what they're actually doing at the time, and also teaching parents the relationship between children and dogs and what they should be aware of and what they could actually be um, doing differently mm. to not create problem behaviors with their puppies because of their children. Because there is a certain age, as in we say nine years old, when kids really understand. Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's that study, isn't there? Like, I think it was 
you you said nine. I think the <laughs> the last study uh, I read was seven. So, yeah. but then who but was then, it? Uh, so you listened to I listened to somebody, uh, Hannah Sagrove over in New Zealand. She was she was uh, don't uh, don't touch my dog campaign. Ignore my, like, dog. Ignore my dog. Ignore That's my dog. That's the one. Don't touch my dog. Not my dog, bitch. She was saying in a really well written post. Um, you know, when you approach a dog that you don't know. Assume that even the adult owner doesn't really understand their dog. Yeah, like they might it. know them to a degree, but realistically, if you don't understand dogs' psychology and behavior, you're guessing. Yeah, like, you are. And, and it's hard with children too. Yes. Especially, you know, they want to squeeze the dog and hold it tight. And that dog's probably giving all these signals like, get away from me, you're yeah. too close. That's so, yeah. it. And then the worst case scenario too is, and it has happened, um, with clients of mine in that the children of, you know, four children under the age of seven were unaware of what they were doing. The mother was unaware and the father of what was going on. The dog was extremely agitated, um, starting to become aggressive, um, never could sleep. And as we've talked about with puppies, very, very important that everyone understands how much sleep a pup, any dog needs particularly as a puppy coming home, it's really important to introduce them into the house, but make sure that their area of where they sleep is dark and um, separated. Is theirs. And is theirs. And so is a kids. confined space. You are not doing your dog um, any favors by putting them in the middle of the lounge in a true <laughs> fair with four children, such as boys or girls that are running around with bicycles in the house and the dog is never sleeping during the day or evening. And with this family, um, the children in large part created um, a lot of issues with this dog, not understanding how they should actually touch it, how they should play with it, how they should leave it alone majority of the time and then the parents not being able to find the time to spend training um, and working with that dog with mental stimulation or uh, relaxing in its own way in its own area so it was independent and confident and it ended up that they had to give the dog away mm. i mean you said uh, a really key point just it kind of brushed got brushed over a little bit but what yeah. you said was well we always say when we're training the dog you know, you can acknowledge what you don't like, you know, acknowledge the behavior that you de deem unwanted or inappropriate to you, but, um, focus on what you would like them to do instead. And the bit that Sorry. you just, you did say it, but it was very brief. You said, you know, with the family, concentrate on what they should be doing instead. Not yes. don't. So as a dog trainer, That's don't right. walk into their home and go, don't do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't do that. We've said that so many times when it comes to training dogs, but we can't do it to the owner either. We can't no. just go, no, you can't do that, mate, and just leave. Yeah, they get That's frustrated. Right. Yeah, Absolutely. And that is where um, going full circle is that education-wise, it's really important. And each time you walk into a consulate, as we talked about before, or a puppy school, you take a deep breath and you walk in and you have to make an assessment within seconds yeah. about how you are going to apply your knowledge um, to those people and the dog and the children at the same time so that everyone is aware and happy that they actually can understand and also that they win as long as the puppy's winning and the children are winning. Puppy doesn't win if they don't win. That's it's, right. Like, yeah. And say. that's the whole point is that um, nine times out of ten, um, the human is unaware. Yeah. yeah. And that's where I think, you know, we spoke about this in our, when we were talking about how we run a consult and we go into it uh with the mindset we go into it as trainers into the mindset of like we're here to help you we, we want to set you up for a win we want to make sure that you're given the information that uh you need to succeed um what to do what not to do yeah. and um this is that's what i mean like joss is so good in the class environment she goes in you watch her eyes like she makes eye contact with them in the room she sees who isn't and the same principles of communicating with dogs apply sure. to people you gotta have their attention before you can give them any sort of director right. yeah and so you walk into a class these days and people are on their fucking phone and you're like mate like this is why i haven't got the patience hey like, i'm sitting i'm sitting there and i'm like boy get off your phone and where joss is a lot nicer <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've witnessed this i've witnessed joss you have. and she'll be talking and then you'll look up and you'll see everyone kind of like down you'll be like 
okay, everybody, let's go outside. And then I'm like, whoa, I'm awake now. <laughs> and I love it. And everyone goes, oh, okay, yeah. let's go. What are we doing? Literally, yeah. you drive the uh, the energy of a class really well where it's like, you know, you because you've got to – delivering information – it's hard. It's hard, hard work, but it's also hard to maintain a level of concentration. That's right. So you've all, you've literally got to like spike them enough to like, okay, you've got your attention. And then as you deliver the information, you're watching them going, oh my God, this is so fucking yeah, hard. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah. And boom, you're in again. Yeah. <laughs> well, as we talked about before, dogs are 0.5 of a second retention span. I think humans are pretty close. Yeah. It's, <laughs> because it's of so. nowadays with social media, phones, we're so busy, constantly on the move. We want our dogs to get it quickly. Mm. Yeah. And because our lives are so fast, we expose them so quickly. We think that they'll get over it. As we talked about, we force them into situations where they should just get over it. They're not human. And we have to actually slow it down. We need to teach our kids the same way in relation to pups, as well as um, I think that nowadays too, a lot of people put their kids in front of a TV screen and it's um, static. And they basically can stare at something and be educated by something else. Instead, dogs just don't do that. We can't no. do that to our dogs. It's about us having the time, taking the time to realize that this is for life. This is for their life. And the first year is really, really important. And I stress it on my puppy schools and consults. People look at me like I'm a bit mad. But I say um, with my two dogs... I did a year's work on both of them, and I remember exactly saying, I will do this until. And I had a set plan in mind about how I saw my puppies in adulthood. And what I did is I wanted to train them as long and as well as with my classes or my clients. I asked them, don't look at the moment right now, but see your puppy as an adult. Where do you want that dog to go in its life? How do you want it to fit into your life? If your life is very busy, you go to sport. Um, you want to take them to friends' houses, to family, to other dogs. It's about environmental as well and teaching them and exposing them positively, but every day, even as a young pup, taking them to those places like the car, in the car, to other and meeting so many different types of people and uh, making sure that you envision your adult dog being able to do everything and anything you're going to do in life. But be, like you say, like be quite specific. Like if I, I want, it's okay to do your method of dog ownership. As in like, you know, you obviously, we always say like, listen to your dog. Yes. And that's super important. It's, it's more important to be honest. Like if it your dog is. is struggling, don't do it. But um, create something, like you say, create something you actually want to do. So by that, what I mean is if you want a cafe dog, yes. if you want your dog to go to the cafe and relax, don't run it around the dog park, <laughs> teaching it that every time it's outside, it's hyper, hoping that it gets so tired that it sleeps it at the cafe. <laughs> Correct. Take oh, it right. to the ca take it for exercise. Exercise is super important, but take it to the cafe and teach it how to settle down. There is right. a massive difference between a dog that is so comfortable that it is settled, yes, than one that is so exhausted it's it sleeps awesome. through it because that dog is jumpy and when it's like startled easily and exhausted and like I've said many times, tired dogs are the same as a tired human. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and like, carries it as we've always talked about. Yeah, and what we teach is that they carry it. Yeah, and I think people think that. You know, oh, I'll just go to the cafe and tie the dog up and they'll eventually stop and just oh, chill. Well, that, that's, that's the other point you raised there. Like when you're talking about get your dog out and exposed, yeah. make sure this is where listening to your dog is so time. important. <laughs> that's right. Make sure it, exposure, getting used to it. I saw another really good post uh, recently. Getting used to it is not enough. Yeah. It's got to be positive for the dog. Yeah. And as a, I mean, I see, I see, typically I see two types of, Two extremes of uh, like dog trainer. You've got the punishment base that like create fear. So like you're sitting at the cafe, no, nah, don't move, don't and like move, yeah. correcting the dog, and you just create a bloody tense weird weirdo of a dog. Like just well, can't move, can't socialize, can't look over there. Fucking weird. And then you got the other extreme, and don't get me wrong, these are better than the punishment based, but they're they're like the hyper positive. They're just like I've got to make everything fucking rainbows. And everything, like, you know, everything's got to shoot glitter out of his ass. And it's just like, mate, calm the fuck down. Every time the dog looks at something, you're like, yes! Like, no, nah, mate, yeah. you're just trying it's to normalize it. Yeah. That's what socializing and habituation is. It's like positive, but doesn't, positive doesn't have to be overstimulating. That's what yeah. I'm getting at. 
Yes. And you see that well, sometimes. it's all in moderation. Correct? Sometimes when you go, like if you do a too high pitch, yes, you see the dog go, <gasps> oh my God. So just, yes, yeah. good job. Taking good your dog job. out and creating positive associations doesn't yeah. have to be mentally hyper. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also correct. over time as well. It's just not going to happen the first time you take them to the cafe, no. they're going to settle. You have to do it over time. I have a client at the moment and um, she's pregnant and she said to me, you know, I want these dogs to be cafe dogs because I'm going to be going to the cafe um, a lot. So what we're working on at the moment is just settling them outside of the cafe. So just teaching them how to settle in a quiet environment mm. and then slowly building up to more busier environments. And then eventually I'll take them to the cafe and get them to settle. Mm. And she even said the other day, she went and sat down with them and she's like, they actually sat down and stopped. One of them went to sleep. And I was like, it's just practice over time. It you is. Do little bits over time, making it positive for the dogs. It's the same one, like the same principles apply in the dog park. If you want your dog, if you are the guy that wants to take your dog to the dog park heaps, great. Mm. But so many people go into the dog park and like go, right, okay, we're here for you to go and socialize. Off you go, son. And then two weeks later, why won't he come back? Because you made it about him leaving you. So take your dog to the dog park, call him back. Like make it about you and the dog. Mm. Nobody calls the dog trainer because they can't get the dog to come back. That's right. Concentrate on that first and let him go. And then call him back because he's good at it. Rather than off you go, son, into the wind. Like, oh, shit, he won't come back. That's when we get a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the other thing. And then that leads into socialization. And you guys have already talked about that at length. But a lot of clients, particularly in puppy schools, come to those courses for that reason, to socialize. But they don't know what it is. But they don't know what it is. So the thing is, is that we as trainers, so in puppy school, a lot of the clients that come in and sign up for the course do come in thinking that socialization is play play on play on play and play. And they also are very aware of the critical period, which is up to 14 weeks in that, oh my God, my dog has to play with everything and anything constantly until it's 14 weeks old. And then I'm good. I'm gone. Done. That's and it's it. actually yeah. not the case. So in my classes, it's really important that I teach that it's more about reading your uh, dog's body language and actually interrupting play quite often. People do look at me quite funny, think I'm quite mad when I say it. Well, you are mad. I am mad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm mad about dogs. <laughs> no, no, you're mental, mate. And I'm, yeah, I'm pretty mad. <laughs> yeah. To all those listening, yeah, I am. Um, but at the same time, we, w we want to set them up to win again. It's going back to the very beginning. And... Uh, it's a challenge in each class because you're putting a dog, particularly in puppy school, into a small space with strangers, people, children, movement, noise, which are the two triggers, as well as the smells of the vet, as well as sizes and shapes and ages of breeds that have to get on together so they think. Mm. It's not necessarily the case. Um, in a lot of incidents, you have dogs that um, hump the whole time. You have dogs that are actually screaming to get at the dogs and want to uh, be boisterous and jump all over the dogs. You have dogs that are timid and have no clue and do not want to play with those dogs. So it's about making sure the interactions are always positive, teaching the owners to be aware of that and why it's happening behaviorally, but also to how to actually give them the tools to handle that and make sure that every interaction with other dogs as a puppy leads to interaction outside to the parks once they can. And that it's not, it's always about um, listening to other dogs and being able to back off as we always talk and not about playing with every single thing it can. Well, you, you've, sorry, I'm going to cut in because yeah. you've got one of the things that I want to, uh, you've said it a minute ago as in, we've talked about socialization before and yes. we have, yeah. but appropriate for this episode, for anybody else yeah. that hasn't listened to that socializing episode, you know, we, we explain that, a social dog is a dog that can react appropriately to the cues and that it's being mm. given. And habituation is about just normalizing the world and creating right. calm association. So everything that Joss just talked about is absolutely bang on. But I wanted that detail to be out there because, mm. you know, that dog that is hyper and screaming to get at the other dog is not being social. Yes, he's friendly. Yes, he only wants to play, but he is not being social. Because he's not listening. He's not thinking properly either. No, no, he's not in a frame of mind. He's going to be set up to fail. If you let, let him, him go up to that really timid dog, you're setting both individuals up to fail. Correct. Like that, that dog that can't show any restraint, 
it needs to be we put emphasis on the owner then to build the relationship between the dog and the owner to call the dog back and they're like oh but he just wants to play yes you're never going to have a fucking problem with this dog playing and let well you will if you only ever let him off that's right but that's not what you need to work on the, yeah. letting him play is the easy part Yes. work on building your communication patterns and being able to call him away from play and that dog that is asking for space and, and not engaging and curled up in a ball in the puppy's goal he'll come out of his shell if you let him yeah but not if you swamp him and yeah. if you let that dog off the lead and we see it we see these videos of puppy schools don't we where the fucking dogs are running around oh, don't. absolutely loopy <clears throat> and you got dogs barking at one another and toys everywhere too yeah you know, a bit crazy yeah and, using the squeakies or bowls or whatever it takes to actually add stimulation and movement which is the things that you don't need it's a lack of understanding of what positive is yes yeah. positive doesn't have to be crazy <laughs> yeah i've already said it but positive it has to be it just has to feel good. Good experience. Yeah. And yeah. that depends on the individual. And there's a massive difference. I've said this before as well, but there is a difference between want and need. Yeah. And you have, in a group environment, you have to look after the one that needs it the most. So that dog that wants to go and play is oh, well and good. That's nice. But the dog that needs space is the one whose pace we have to go at. Yeah. Because, and, and you know what? Both dogs are going to win. If you set that up, like we always teach people, and you know when you come into class please do this like yes bring your dog in and con start working on you building your relationship with your dog sit down loose lead focus on me using food rewards yeah don't come in and let your dog go bananas with all the dogs and then try and calm them down same as in dog park and that dog that is sitting under the chair nervous mm -hmm. is got all of a sudden going to see this other individual putting no pressure on him and you're going to get curiosity because he's not being overwhelmed that dog that's was crazy and trying to get at the other dog is now concentrating on his owner and they've got they've built their relationship it's win-win that that owner can let that dog off and let it go and play whenever they want to and they choose to and the dog that lacks confidence is growing in confidence yeah whereas if you just let it free for all well, you know, well, it's like yeah sometimes you would get the same mm -hmm. you know some dogs actually aren't fit to play with other yeah. dogs exactly and even you were saying before about the timid dog under the table, I work with a lot of dash hounds and always at the yeah, start, they're, dash and lady. <laughs> they're always dash the little timid ones. And I just they say, are. wait till the end of week five, week yes. four, week five, trust me, your dog will come out of its shell. Yeah. And they do. And they eventually play. And they're like, how did you know that? That's I right. said, you seem to build their confidence up and take it slowly. And that's the thing as well is in the course until, and I guess that's the other thing with humans, all of us in some way is that it's the trust factor and actually believing what you're actually teaching is going to work. And so at the very beginning, they don't see it. And then you say, do the work, be patient. Let's see what happens. It's not always a guarantee, but if you put the work in, if you spend the time and you're patient and we work alongside each other and you ask me and you're curious and you actually apply that to training and the bond between your dog, each class it builds and better and better. And a lot of my classes, I almost cut, I'm almost brought to tears because it is a beautiful thing to watch as the human and the dog get it. Week five is, and, I always nearly cry in week five. Yeah. I go, I'm like, yeah. okay guys, um, so it's week five and um, this is the end. And they're like, oh, week one, you know, we just thought, what have we done? We've got this crazy puppy. And then week five, they're all sitting there, calm, patient for the photo. That's right. And, and the best, like, oh. but the best is too, is some of them lately, not all class, it's all individual, obviously, depending on the dog and the, and the people in the class. But generally on average, I've been getting about the third week. Um, the ones that are boisterous or overexcited learn to settle. The ones that are timid come out. Yeah. And the, but it's the owners that look at you and they come in early to class. Yeah. They get there and say, see what we've done. I love and it. And they're so Absolutely. excited. And yeah. I'm like, oh my God. And it's they're like, the yeah, I know. Part. I know. Oh, it's and the then they want to show the whole class. And yeah. that's the whole point of the classes of the consults is to actually translate that for you to get it for me not to actually to teach you and your dog but then teach you how to do it that's a good trainer i don't need to 
keep doing it for you. I want you to understand it and apply it to your dog and your life with your dog and your relationship and the bond that's created. And then to actually watch the progress, no matter how slow it is, how little it is, how long it takes, there always will be if you put it in, if you put the work in and you understand it and you ask the questions. The other thing that happens a lot too is that people say, okay, didn't work. You can't give up that easily. If you yeah. really want to do it and you want your dog to be healthy and happy in all respects, we have to put the work in. It's like anything in life. And I think quite often a lot of people just go, it's a dog. You know, I just wanted to play. I wanted to actually get on um, into my life and, you know, sit at home and do whatever it does as a dog. And you have to relate it to children is you can't let your children just grow up and do whatever they want. There's yeah. boundaries, there's training, there's work, there's communication, communication. Yeah. Um, and then everything else, you know, nutrition and diet, sleep, whatever it is and social. So the most beautiful thing is with the combination of them, um, you know, employing us to do what we do, but then taking it on board and then asking questions. That's my biggest thing is that keep asking, keep trying, yeah. keep um, researching. And we're always there for everyone, no yeah. matter 100%. when it is. I heard a really good uh, saying the other day. It was along like about asking questions. And it's like, mm. if you, um, if you ask a question, I think it was a Chinese thing, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's like, if you ask the question, you're foolish for a second. If you don't ask the question, you'll foolish a lifetime. I That's, love that. Yeah, I love that. That's a great one. And what you said before too, Joss, I always say in the last class, I say, this is not the end, you know, it's message, just the beginning. call me in six months, you know, give me updates as well. I, I actually saw That's a right. client not long ago and this dog could just not cope in class. Yeah. And Iona was actually in my class and she brought Doug in and we both actually had to help. Um, this client and I saw them not long ago and the dog came up to me sat at my feet pat it and then we were chatting just lay down and just chill yeah and she's like look at what the difference. he is now like yeah, that's right if I didn't do that class I don't know what the hell we would have done it was a kelpie <laughs> kelpie cross yes. something and she just went thank you so much and well, I said still give me updates like I still want to know about it and I actually of course I cried after of course, of course you did. <laughs> so we do. I know. I know. Me but I was with my no, partner. I was with my partner and I was just so happy. And I was like, you don't understand how stressful that was. And it was hard for me as well because I was yes. still learning and I was still learning how to be a teacher. And thank God I had Iona there to help me with the yeah. class. But, she's a rock. Like. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've said this before. She's my rock. Yeah. But it was just so amazing to see that dog out in public, not losing its mind right. and able to sit and stop. Well, that's the other thing too, is if we lose it, it's not going to help anyone either. Definitely. Yeah. And there has to be that ability as a professional to take a breath ourselves and say, wow, okay, this one is a difficult one. It's mm. never easy. Mm. And you get um, them all the time. And no matter how experienced you are, we're, uh, this is what's so amazing about this job and this profession is that I do believe we learn every single second of every day and we're not going to stop learning because um, dogs can't speak English. <laughs> yeah, that's it. And they are, they are literally our teacher. We learn so much from them and then we have to apply it. But also too, in saying that, I do have a client with a staffie at the moment and this this is all part of it, is them more importantly out of the class, not to say there's good and bad and ugly, but that dog is having the hardest time in the class out of any of the others. And yet the first day, um, she, the mother was a professional, um, working 18 hour days with two boys, very young, very boisterous and a husband that would stay at home. And this dog is a staffy, had a lot of energy. Um, the first class she was in tears and she was like, I need help. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what do you need? How yeah. about this? So they're signed up for a puppy package and an extension of the puppy school. But every week I've noticed she comes in standing up straight, hasn't cried since, very confident. I think the hardest thing as well is people get a puppy thinking, I know what I'm doing. I know how to handle this puppy. I know what to do. 
and then you come into a puppy school class and you go, shit, I need help. Like yes. I actually don't know what I'm doing. And then they reach out to you and it's so nice that they can actually admit that and say, I actually don't know what I'm doing because people get embarrassed. And I always yes. say in my first class as well, please do not compare yourself to the other puppies in the class. <laughs> Your dog may be at different stages of life and different stages of learning. So don't compare yourselves. Everyone's yeah. different. And they're going to have different goals. Like, yeah, exactly. Yes. You know, this, the, the puppy school that we teach is a, basically a loose model now on what I used to do a long time. I haven't done a puppy school for a couple of years. Mm. Um, but I rem it was my gut feeling at the time. I, I, I'd not designed a puppy school, um, as in like previous to the one I taught. And what I found in session one was I wanted to teach everybody to come in and be open. And it was... It was safe space. Yeah, yes, safe yeah. space. Come in and communicate how uh, what's going on with your puppy in in your life. Um, what are your goals? What are you struggling with? And at the same time, while I'm listening to that and using my experience in this industry to try to help the best way I can, I'm listening to the dogs as well and watching them and and analyzing. Okay, what does the puppy need and want and not one and listening to the dogs every single one of them that's that's the bit that joss is i i think like that's why she's do, doing it for me and jade's the same and it's great to see the different levels of uh, experience because jade all of a sudden like her other trainer she's in there and you know first couple of times she's like oh my god this is so much information to take on <laughs> yes we both helped jade with yeah. yeah she was this nervous little girl and that's now right. she's doing it by herself and i was the same you know I, I sat in on yours sat in on yours in as well and sat in on the owners and the first session i just remember being like oh my god i was so nervous and that's what so we scared. talked about before one-on-one -on -one consults are one thing in groups or other even when we do group, group classes yeah oh yeah. yeah especially outside in the external <laughs> environment joss would be like go you can you can teach us i'm like joss i don't know I'm <laughs> yeah. and the same thing applies is that i you just because you have numbers you have different breeds and personalities all going on at the same time and then some so the external environment as well or the internal environment and groups are very difficult and puppies i find um people often I think talk about puppies as oh it's so easy I don't believe that's the case <laughs> what were you saying I literally sat a puppy last week and it's 15 weeks old mm. and I just went oh wow I'm not ready for a puppy yet and I suggest go and sit a puppy if you want to get one go yeah. and sit one first because it's a hell of a lot of work don't do it, it. don't do it when it's just sleeping that's not reality <laughs> yes no <laughs> no, yeah. no and that's it like you know the information you can deliver in a class as well is uh, is less so than you can with a one-on-one. -on -one. That's right. You know, you can give a baseline of information, but uh, to a degree, it will be generic until you yes. until you yeah. ask the individual. Um, it's the same when we're doing social media. You know, yeah. you, when when you hear hooves, guys, think horses, not zebras. <laughs> Fuck me. You know, if it's if you're the anomaly. <laughs> It is not aimed at you. That generic right. piece of information in the class or <laughs> online is not aimed at you if you're the anomaly. If you're the zebra, then it doesn't apply. Well, I think, too, that goes back to what we were saying about asking a question, is that also, too, putting it out to new clients coming in or thinking about pups and classes and what we offer as a service. Um, take what we say individually and utilize that for you and your pup and your relationship at yeah. the time as well. You can ask a question, say, actually, that doesn't apply to me, does it? Absolutely. Um, or how does it apply to me? What yeah. more can I do with that information? It's about you also not being part of the herd, mm. so to speak, or the group, and just standing there and saying, okay, yep, I'll do a sit. No, I'll do a sit today. Okay. Um, it's about how much more can I do to make it better between my dog and I in the realms of what you're educating me to do. We're there to educate, but we're also there to provide a service and then some, yeah. because you can get whatever you want out of it, or you can sit back in the sidelines and go, ah, that's enough. It depends on how much you want to get out of it. And I think the more you get out of it, the more you're going to learn, the more your puppy's going to benefit um, in that realm as well. And when it comes to puppy school, um, the whole idea that going to puppy school is to some people, I think, still, is that it's all about play and 
why are you trying to teach me anything? <laughs> what are you doing? You're standing up there talking about problem behaviors that can come about, that there are fear periods, that you also hit juvenile period, that, oh, there is life after puppydom, and that um, basically we are actually educating you within the realms of that puppy class. And it's not just about social play. You need to be aware of what is next. Yeah, yeah. set you up for a win because... I think that's it. And, and puppy school is not the end of the training. No. And I do believe it's just the beginning and there's a lot of work to be done. And as we all know, puppies are work. Um, but the work that you put in creates a better life for you and your pup and the family. And when Doing... they leave puppy school, you know, this is where yep. later on down the track, you step in again. And like, you've that's got that correct. relationship with that puppy school, uh, puppy client from the school and you can come out and you can, you know, assess the home and you can get to know them a bit better. That's right. And this is the whole point too, is that puppy school is one um, element of it, but there is follow up after that. And there is also the setup. And as your dog ages, it's really important that you keep the training up um, and you still c continue to do the work as the dog grows in keep, the first year and exposing also it. exposing it. And it's really important to expose your pup. Um, we offer um, an exposure, positive exposure checklist for all puppies so that um, even during the early times that they're really getting exposed and desensitized to noises and the external environment um, at a really young age with you so that that world outside eventually doesn't become scary and um, everything you want your dog to be for the rest of its life becomes a positive um, and creating that really calm association and bond. That's it. You said it a minute ago about how when you stood there in the puppy class and you are engaging the person as much as the dog, if not more, uh, and they're looking at you like you're some weirdo, what you're trying to do is set them up to normalize the world so that they don't have a fear response. That's right. So that like, puppy exposure checklist, you know, you you might not live near a skate park. You might, you know, but it's on there. Like we've tried to come up with as many options for you to consider, see it and go, yeah, do you know what? That is actually part of this dog's environment. I need to normalize that. And this is where, you know, after puppy school's finished, give us a call because yes. we're not, we're there for you. That's our job. We like our job. Yeah. Um, yeah. We don't just go, yeah, bye on your way. <laughs> we're exactly. Like, we're actually, yeah, we actually care. And how many, I mean, we send a, a questionnaire out to clients after yes. uh, when they're doing a one-on-one -on -one. what uh, what previous training one of the questions in it what previous training have you had with your dog and so many have just they write down puppy training was, yep. and the dog's seven you're like right. well shit you mean <laughs> that dog hasn't had any training for seven years that's what i'm getting at is like puppy school and puppy training is the beginning of you creating a communication pattern with your dog and understanding your dog so that you can then, um, you know, continue doing it. And it's incredible to watch and see clients and owners of puppies that have continued to do the work and the training beyond um, that time. It's evident, isn't it? And you it's can tell. Evident. Yeah, it, you 100%. You can completely tell. And realistically, we love the business, but we would rather pups to be um, growing into um, a having a better life and not having to go through the dogs that we train at six months and after because they didn't have exposure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dogs are, they're always learning, aren't they? They yeah. always are. I think people don't know that. I, I, I think you're right. Actually. Yeah. I mean, it's, you say it out loud and you automatically go, yeah, of course they are. But genuinely people get yes. stumped and that's something we see all the time. They go, mm -hmm. oh shit, you're right. Um, and they forget that they are learning and, you know, they've trained it to sit or they've trained recall at home and then they take it to the park and go, why don't you know it? Or they continue to take it to the park and just because it used to be good at recall in the park, they don't bother anymore. That dog is learning that other things are more fun than you That's or right. more interesting than you. And then you end up resorting potentially to trying to grab your dog and then you're trying to snatch your dog and your dog's trying to evade you. Well, yeah, there's consequences because your dog is learning. That's right. And so are you. And that's where putting in those foundations, mm. you said it a few times today, like getting a dog is work. I've said it for a long time. Getting a dog is work. 
you either do the work or make it hard work. That's right. And and keep working. Yes, exactly. <sighs> Just keep working. It's keep like at a, it. It's like a relationship with a human. Yeah, you know, your partner. If you get complacent and stop communicating, they will resent you. They That's will. Right. They will leave you. They would basically tr not. You won't have that relation, same relationship as you once had. You have to maintain the relationship. Well, I do really, um, one of my famous sayings to a lot of my clients who um, all know, I always say, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Look at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just. That's it. Well, you know, you got into this industry 10 years ago. Having right. lived a whole different professional life. We're not talking about my age. We won't say it out loud. She's 20. Sure. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> Josh has had lots of experience. I've and... had a lot of experience. Yes. I'm an old dog, but young at heart. Yeah. <laughs> but that's it. You oh know, my gosh. We're always learning. Dogs are always learning. That's yeah. the way brains work. Um, and that, that new information is challenging, um, especially when you're got such a memory bank of prior learning and this is mm. where you know you you receive something new you probably you probably inclined to push against it if you have an opposing theory um and this is why we continue to study ourselves because we don't know everything huh. we're only ever teaching what is current and when somebody says oh science is just changing i'm like yeah that's what science does it evolves <laughs> exactly like, yeah of course, but what are we meant to do? But like, no, nah, that's new information, so I just completely fucking ignore it. I don't want to know it, um, and I'm going to stay where I am. No, like, come on, mate, like, keep up. Like, sure, if there is not a big enough evidence base, be, be skeptical. Yeah. But, you know, bear, bear it in mind. Don't just roll it out. Consider it as an option, at least. Re it was in, um, we live in a world at the moment where we've got an algorithm bias so everything you open up online is there to please you um it's there to trigger the dopamine that's the way facebook and instagram and all the social media works you are uh, google you if you've got a different political uh, values to me and different search history to me we can google the same topic and get different results because that's the way the internet works and what the danger of that is, is that we end up uh, reinforcing our own beliefs, regardless of whether they're right or not. We only actually want to hear what we want to hear. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we're presented with information that challenges that, we push back. That's why social media doesn't do it. The social media is there to make you stay on there. Yeah. Um, yeah I'm not there to rant about social media. I'm on it all the time. <laughs> but... I was going to say, that's even uh, one of my clients in puppy school uh, said they read a study about tail wagging. Mm. And I went, oh, I haven't heard about that before. And I contacted you, Ian. I was like, have you heard about this study about the different ways left and right yes. tail wagging? Because mm. I'm not sure. I'd, I said to her, I've never heard of it. Yeah. And you go, oh, yeah, actually, someone sent it to you. Yes, yeah. they did. Yeah. So it was, that's just new information I, I've never heard of before. So Yeah. And instantly, you can't help it. New inf And this is what I'm saying with dogs, right? You get new information. Survival says... Treat no. new information <laughs> as with skepticism. That's yeah. right. And you will instantly go, nah. Yeah. <laughs> Always. But, but when you train, this is what we've got to remember when we're training a dog, right? Dogs don't have any perception of the human world. You are presenting new information all the time and their nervous center turns on 50 million times a day compared to ours. And it's why it's so easy to see a hyperactive dog and normalize it. I'm not going to back. We've talked about that a lot in the past, but it's context, right? And when you're what i'm getting at is when you um presented information be open-minded that's right you know we we try to be and it's bloody hard you know I'm, i try to practice what i preach but that's again that's why i go off and study because i want to go and learn from people that have got the most current information and these guys will i'm going to go and study in january and they're going to challenge me and i'm going to basically i know what i'm like <laughs> i'm going to go oh, this is yes. difficult to digest <laughs> But that's the point. I, I'm not but that's why you're actually going to do it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, because it's a growth mindset. That's right. And, and you want to learn. Exactly. Yeah. And Unlike people, some other people. And our clients do too. Yeah. Well, that's why they called you. They yeah. called you for help. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. And there was a reason. So, yeah. yeah, trust it. Exactly. Right, guys. Joss, Thank thanks you. so much Thank for coming you. in. Thank you, guys. It was my pleasure. <laughs> it was all Loved it. Loved it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we will put that uh, puppy checklist 
uh, exposure checklist on the um, on social media for everybody it is available on yeah. our website. Um, you can go in the fact sheets; it's in there. But we'll put it in online. Behaviors. Correct. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Leave your feedback and, um, and give it to us. That'll be great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just leave it. Up. Okay, then. <laughs> Words. All right, guys. Thank you so much. And remember, a healthy dog's a happy dog. Woo. And that was the podcast.